here is uh, section six of this workshop where we're going to cover that other aspect of biodiversity that I mentioned, which is called beta diversity. One other interesting uh, component of biodiversity is trying to understand how different sites differ from each other. So going back to this slide I showed before, remember gamma diversity is the total diversity in our study region. That includes all the terminal taxa and the phylogeny that connects them and all their spatial data. And what we talked about last section of the workshop was the alpha diversity, how much is contained in each individual place. And now we're going to discuss the beta phylogeny, which is how much do they differ between places. California is one of the famous places uh, where uh, beta diversity is a really important component of biodiversity. And so we'll we definitely have to consider this for California, but we probably have to consider it for anywhere. So I would imagine that most uh, folks have had some experience with turnover measures, beta diversity measures, some commonly used indices are Jacquard's coefficient and Sorensen's coefficient. These are usually used to, in the, in the case of species that are shared and not shared, so the way you might have had this in uh, basic ecology would be if I'm comparing two places, you know, A and B, then uh, I want to have a, a ratio that's in the second term here, which is all of the species found in both places. And then B in the denominator of that one is uh, that number plus the ones that are unique to site one and and are unique to site two and then this is a dissimilarity matrix so you're doing that term subtracting it from one and so just to give you a super simple example just so you can see how it's calculated and we're only talking about species now is if i'm comparing mount diablo and mount hamilton for some group of organisms if there's not a single species in common then uh, B and C are going to be, uh, neither of them, uh, let's say there'll be no, um, no unique ones to B or no unique ones to C, so those are zero. So it's gonna be one minus A over A. So you're basically, if they have no species in common, then the value of uh, turnover is one or 100%, you can think of it. That means all the species are different. Whereas if they were all exactly the same, then the Jacquard's coefficient would um, not have any uh, separate species. And so the Jacquard's coefficient would be zero. And the interpretation of that would be there's no turnover between the two. So we're basically saying when I take two places and I compare them in this case for species, then uh, how much change is there? How much turnover is there between one place and the other? And it ranges between zero and one, where zero is they're all the same and one is that they're all different. And usually communities have an intermediate value, which indicates how much turnover there is. So that is pretty familiar. And I assume most people have seen that in some form or another. But what may not be as familiar is that there's an exact phylogenic analog of these where a, B, and C now are not the species that they have in common or don't have in common, but rather the branch links that they have in common or don't have in common. So it's a, analogous theoretically, but A, B, and C here are now talking about shared branch links. So we could talk about, I got two places. I have looked at the taxa that are there and their place in the tree in both. And I want to know um, how different are these? That's what's called phylogenetic turnover. And you can have phylogicards and phylosorensens and other metrics. And that's pretty technical. That doesn't matter so much as the idea that um, when we do phylo turnover, we're talking about how different is the phylogenetic tree that's present in the two places. And so here's... Um, the, the top tree illustrates just phyloturnover per se, 
which is um, when we're comparing two sites and then we want to um, say how different are they, we just count up the branch lengths that are the same on both trees and that are different on the trees. A particularly interesting kind of phylogenetic turnover is this range-weighted phylogenetic turnover, where instead of doing the phylo turnover on the original tree, we do it on that range-weighted tree. So we're counting the more range-restricted branches more than we are the widespread branches. So the range phylogenic range-weighted turnover emphasizes the uh, narrowly distributed lineages which turns out to be a much better measure for using for looking uh, for biotic breaks for defining communities or biomes. Our intuitions, when we do that, we talk about well, what's Joshua Tree Woodland, we're looking for, or, or Coast Redwood Forest, we're looking for not taxa that are all over the state, uh, California, that doesn't help us to define that particular region. We're looking for uh, taxa that have limited ranges. So this particular, while we're not going to talk a lot about biome differentiation, uh, this range-weighted uh, phylo turnover turns out to be an even better measure of turnover than the phylo turnover, and both of them are better than the species turnover, as we'll talk about here in a minute. This illustrates, this map may be a little complicated, so I'm going to um, walk through it, and this is using Australia as an example, because this is where it was developed. Principle applies anywhere, though. And this is comparing the four kinds of turnover. So the top row here is uh, regular species turnover. And then there and below here is the uh, range weighted uh, species turnover. Upper right is the phylo turnover on the original tree. And in the lower right is the range-weighted phylo turnover. So that's turnover on the range-weighted tree, the PE turnover. And what this means, the way you can interpret this, is there's an index cell right here in southwestern, the Mediterranean part of Australia that in a lot of ways looks like California, has the same climate. The That grid cell is being compared to all the other grid cells. And where it's red, it's very different. And where it's uh, one of the bluer colors, it's uh, quite uh, similar. So when you use species turnover, the turnover happens quicker. So there is kind of a, most of the continent is uh, red. Whereas when you do phylo turnover, turnover doesn't happen as fast because even though there may not be the terminal branch shared between two grid cells, there's deeper branches that are shared. So if there's uh, one eucalyptus that's in that site and a different one that's in the other site that's closely related, they're still going to count as pretty similar under the phylo measure. But if they have a different species name, they're going to count as zero similarity under the species measure. So the species measure is not sensitive to the relationships of the organisms. So this is one area where branch length uh, helps. But the trouble with phylo turnover is since there's going to be the big branches of the phylogeny present almost everywhere, then there's not a lot of turnover. So even the most distant part of Australia uh, still has a decent amount of phylo similarity with that particular grid cell because you're counting the deeper branches. Like there is a, uh, every one of the major plant families, let's say, is represented in all these places, even though it's different uh, terminal lineages. And so the range weighting of species turnover, which is the lower left map, is even more harsh in turning over really quickly. Whereas we like the file of range weighted turnover here because it does, it's you'd call it saturation. So you want a metric that will turn over in some parts of the map. So the regular file of turnover is not super useful since all parts of the map are kind of similar in terms of the phylogeny. When you do the range-weighted part, though, you get kind of a sweet spot between uh, having some a measure that does turn over and a measure that is um, also taking into account relationships. So in this particular paper here in 2016, we are advocating this range-weighted phylo turnover and have shown here and elsewhere that it, if you're trying to define biotic regions, it's really uh, the best 
but there's other applications of it other than defining biotic regions. That 2017 paper I talked about in the last section, and I showed this canopy map already, and I showed the precipitation correlation already in the last section. But this is a, an added map to that, which I want to explain. The grid cells that are highlighted here are the same grid cells that are in this map. So this is restricted to only the grid cells that are centers of endemism, according to this analysis. So the, the question that's being asked in the file of turnover is of the centers of endemism, which ones are similar to which other ones? Not across the whole map, but just the uh, colored in cells. And the diagram over here is one of those uh, phonetic distance diagrams. It's not a phylogeny. This, this is not a phylogeny here, but it is grouping together the grid cells based on how many of the branches of the tree they share. So it's a phylogenetically based phonetic measure. And the colors here correspond to the clusters that are in this diagram. Oops. Light green is this uh, north coast itself. Darker green is the interior uh, ranges, Siskiyou and uh, Klamath and so forth. And so this is telling us the relationships of these centers. And the, it helps us unpack this finding, which was that uh, the dry areas are where the center's endemism are, except for this one region in northwestern California. So all of these green colored spots here are these significant cells, and they're on the wetter end of the precipitation gradient. So everything else other than the green cells is all at the dry end of the spectrum, but there's this one region of California that's at the other end of the spectrum where the endemism is associated with um, precipitation and presumably other variables as well. So the range-weighted phylo turnover can be useful for uh, kind of dissecting the results you get from any of these alpha diversity analyses to try to understand which grid cells are similar to which other ones. And here's an example that we did in the Chile study where what we're doing here is actually trying to define what the biotic regions are among the in the flora of uh, Chile. And this is range-weighted phylo turnover not just between the grid cells that are significant centers of endemism, but all the grid cells, except for a couple of grid cells in here that had no data at all. So this was this is what happens when you have no data for a place on the map. It's blank. And what we found, uh, to make a long story short, is the phylo turnover shows pretty precisely where the boundaries are of the three big zones in Chile, the desert area here, Mediterranean climate area here, and then this temperate rainforest kind of like the Pacific Northwest um, down in here. And, you know, the details of this, this is just the three main clusters, but within each of those clusters, there's other clusters which are quite useful in uh, trying to understand the overall vegetation. So this is a, one of these ensemble properties that's looking at uh, the difference. And if you have any experience with uh, image analysis, you'll have uh, some understanding of what's going on here. You're trying to detect edges, basically. The face recognition software, for example, that's widely used these days uh, for good and for bad, is uh, analyzing the pixels that are on the image and comparing them one to another and looking for edges. And an edge is where there's a big shift in values over a small distance. So that's how they can, your camera can tell you where the faces are in your uh, picture. It's it's doing image analysis and recognizing where there's uh, a similar set of grid cells that have a sharp boundary with another one. So believe it or not, uh, face recognition software has a lot in common with uh, trying to find biotic regions in the, the landscape. In all cases, you're trying to look for these edges, like the between the red and blue here, which is a really deep uh, split where there's a lot of turnover across one boundary, whereas within this region, there's less turnover. So what we mean by a biotic break is where there is a sharp turnover boundary 
where there's a lot of turnover between adjacent pixels here and not as much in here. So it's uh, it's quite useful actually, and probably has a, a big future to it in um, with software development. One way you can try to recognize biomes, and here's an attempt in California using our California data. This is again not comparing all centers endemism to each other. This is just comparing all pixels to each other, and trying to find those edges that I was talking about. And we find a nice correspondence, for example, to the boundary of the California floristic province, for example, which would be right along here. Uh, we find nice distinction, you know, with the desert um, boundary with uh, the cismontane. Uh, but you see some interesting relationships that would not necessarily be um, otherwise apparent. This is an analysis that is not in the software here is not insisting on any spatial connection between the grid cells so that blue cluster corresponding to the pacific northwest and the high sierra just appears as a cluster in here kind of on its own and there's no restriction that the grid cells actually touch each other there's other kind of software called skater which is doing the same thing but has a constraint in it that the regions are uh, spatially contiguous so that same data analyzed in this slightly different way is um here's what the map of california would look like under normal phyla turnover and here's what it looks like under the range weighted phyla turnover and uh, there's oh i don't know more interpretable boundaries under the range weighted phyla turnover but there's counterintuitive results. Oh, in this paper, which has been published yet, we're comparing it to our uh, standard Jepson regions we use in the Jepson e flora. And it matches in a lot of ways. But one distinction you just, just to point out one reason why you want to do this kind of thing is that any of the analyses we do, we never see the distinction between the Mojave and the Sonoran Desert, which we show in the Jepson regions and everybody else shows. There is there are breaks in the desert, but they don't correspond to any of the boundaries that um, are normally used. And I think that's one thing indicates the value of this kind of uh, study because the human mind is influenced by indicator taxa. And so we see certain taxa that cease their distribution in one particular place, like in Joshua Tree National Monument, there's a signed by the road that says you are now entering the Mojave Desert, which is pretty much where the Joshua trees start and the creosote bush uh, goes down in frequency. The um, Those kind of obvious breaks to human eyes apparently are not the same kind of break to the smaller plants because the smaller plants are, you know, distributed across that boundary. So what looks like an edge to the human eye with without an analysis may turn out to not to be a, a good break once you analyze it. If the majority of taxa don't see a particular boundary that one taxon would indicate, that would just mean if you're going to define biomes by the ensemble of organisms, you might have to move the boundary a bit. There's uh, more of a distinction between sort of the area up by Owens Valley and up that way and the rest of the desert, for example. So this just shows you some of the applications that uh, could be uh, applied with the um, the beta diversity. It, it would depend on the question that you had. You could use beta diversity measures to um, try to get insight into the alpha diversity measures that you got to try to understand their causes, like correlating the turnover with a uh, climate or something like that. Um, you could use it for the purposes of drawing community boundaries or biome boundaries on a map, trying to decide what the, you know, coastal sage scrub really is and that kind of thing, um, all depending on what your, what your data are. But these two components of alpha diversity and beta diversity work together in concert to help you understand the gamma diversity, which is the whole uh, big picture. So we can stop and take a little bit of uh, questions and discussion here. And then we'll move on into our, the final section is going to be on the conservation application. So we'll save plenty of time for that. <laughs>